As we review for Unit 1, which was all about limits and continuity, I'd like us to practice some questions from past AP calculus exams. However, because this is Unit 1, we don't actually have enough information to do entire free response questions, where Part A, B, C might be on uh, things from future units. So I've pulled together parts of free response questions from past exams which do pertain to limits and continuity. Let's start with free response question number six from the 2008 exam part D. Function f involves the natural log of x. So before we answer the actual question, let's make sure we remember our parent functions. You should have memorized what the parent function uh, natural log x looks like. It has a vertical asymptote, which is the y-axis, and it goes like this, it passes through an x value of one. So this is what natural log x looks like. Uh, with this in mind, you know that as x approaches zero, I'm gonna go ahead and write this down, as x approaches zero from the right, natural log x approaches negative infinity. So as we approach zero from the right, this function just falls down, down, down. Therefore, as x approaches zero from the right, the overall function f of x is going to approach negative infinity over zero. But this means we have a really big negative number divided by a really tiny positive number. So we're going to get a really, really big negative number. In other words, the overall value of the function is approaching negative infinity. So we should say that the limit does not exist. Let's move on to free response question number six from the 2003 exam. Function f is defined by this piecewise function, and we have to figure out if it is continuous at x equals three. According to the definition of continuity, if f is continuous at x equals three, then the limit as x approaches three from the left must equal the limit as x approaches three from the right which must also equal the value of the function at three. So let's find the value of each of these three things and see if they are all equal. Let's start with the limit as x approaches three from the left. From the left, the function is defined by the square root of x plus one. So this limit uh, we can find by direct substitution. Substituting three for x gives us the square root of three plus one, which is equal to the square root of four, which is just two. So that is the limit as x approaches three from the left. Now, what about the limit as x approaches three from the right? The function on the right will be defined by uh, five minus x. So the limit as x approaches three from the right of f of x, by direct substitution, we have uh, five minus three, which again is equal to two. So far, so good. We need to check one last thing. We need to find the value of the function at three. Well, at three, uh, you can see the or equal to line right here. So when x is equal to three, the function is again defined by the square root of x plus one. So we're gonna do uh, the square root of x plus one, but we're gonna do direct substitution, obviously. So this will be the square root of three plus one, which again will give us two. So because all of these are equal, we know that the function is continuous at x equals three. I'm just going to write that out. In conclusion, we can say, since the limit as x approaches three from the left equals the limit as x approaches three from the right, 
which equals the value of the function at 3, then f of x is continuous at x equals 3. Let's move on to problem number 2 from the 1998 exam. Let f be the function given by f of x equals 2x times e to the 2x. Find the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x and find the limit as x approaches positive infinity of f of x. Let's start with the limit as x approaches negative infinity. I'm going to show you how to do this problem two different ways. First, I'm going to show you how to do it using techniques that we learn in unit one. Then, I'm going to show you how to do the same problem using derivatives and something called L'Hopital's rule, which we learn in unit four. So, if you're watching this video while you're still in unit one, the first method is going to be the one you're going to want to pay attention to. But if you are reviewing for the AP exam, you might want to use the more advanced method involving derivatives and L'Hopital's rule. In Unit 1, we learned an acronym called FEPL. FEPL stands for factorial, exponential, polynomial, and logarithmic. We can use FEPL when x is approaching positive infinity or negative infinity. It ranks the functions in order of how fast they grow as x is approaching infinity. The functions towards the top grow faster, and the ones toward the bottom grow slower. We can view f of x as a polynomial function times an exponential function. To use FEPL, we need to rewrite this as a fraction. So I'm going to drop the exponential part down to the denominator and write it as e to the negative 2x power. So now we have this. Imagine what happens to the numerator as x approaches negative infinity. So you can kind of think of this as 2 times negative infinity. 2 times a very, very negative number is still a very, very negative number. So as x approaches negative infinity, 2x approaches negative infinity. What about the denominator? You should be thinking something like e to the negative 2 times negative infinity. A negative times a negative is a positive. So this would be like e to the positive infinity. But e to the infinity power is just infinity. So as x approaches negative infinity, the denominator is approaching infinity. So here's where Feppel comes in. The numerator is a very simple polynomial expression while the denominator is an exponential expression. Both of these are approaching some type of infinity, but they are not approaching infinity at the same rate. Exponential is higher on the list, and polynomial is lower. This reminds us that the denominator is going to be growing faster, while the numerator is growing slower. Because the denominator is growing faster compared to the numerator, it means that the magnitude of the denominator is getting bigger and bigger and bigger compared to the magnitude of the numerator. So the overall value of the fraction is getting closer and closer and closer to zero. So that's the limit. So that's how you can find the limit using only skills from unit one. Now I'm going to jump ahead to unit 4 and show you how to find the same limit using derivatives and L'Hopital's rule. First of all, L'Hopital's rule can only be used when your expression is approaching infinity over infinity or 0 over 0. We found that our function, when written as a fraction, is approaching negative infinity over positive infinity. That counts as infinity over infinity so we can use L'Hopital's rule. L'Hopital's rule says that the limit of f over g will equal the limit of f prime over g prime. In other words, we can take the derivative of the numerator and the denominator without changing the limit. So let's take the derivative of the numerator and the denominator and find the limit of that. By the way, in order to use L'Hopital's rule, 
you have to show these arrows like I did because you're not allowed to use L'Hopital's rule unless the numerator and denominator are approaching infinity or they can both be approaching zero. But you have to show it with arrows like this. This is mandatory. So the derivative of 2x is just 2. And this is a memorized rule. The derivative of e to the something is still e to the something. So when you take the derivative of an exponential expression, it doesn't change except for the fact that you have to do the chain rule. Because we have a function inside of a function, we then have to multiply by the derivative of the inner function. So the derivative of negative 2x is negative 2, so we will have to multiply by that. I'm noticing that these 2's will cancel out, so I think I'm going to go ahead and do that. So now we have this. Let's think about what's happening to the value of this fraction as x approaches negative infinity. Of course, the numerator is a constant, so that is just going to stay 1. What about the denominator? So this is what I'm thinking. I've got this negative sign out in the front, and I've got e to the negative 2x, but the x is approaching negative infinity. So I'm going to temporarily think negative 2 times negative infinity. That's just going to be positive infinity. If I take a very negative number and then multiply it by negative 2, I'm going to get a very, very big positive number. So basically, I have negative e to the infinity power. e to the infinity power is just infinity. But with the negative sign in front, I have negative infinity. But what happens to the overall value of the fraction if the numerator is a constant while the denominator is getting more and more and more negative? Imagine 1 over negative 10, 1 over negative 100, 1 over negative 1,000, 1 over negative a million, 1 over negative a billion. What is happening to the value of that fraction? Well, it is getting closer and closer and closer to 0. So that is the limit. We still need to talk about the limit as x approaches positive infinity, but this is super easy. If x is approaching infinity, then that means that 2 times x is also approaching infinity, and e to the 2x. This is like e to the infinity. So that's approaching infinity. So basically we are looking at infinity times infinity. Guess what that is? You guessed it, that's infinity. Or we can say that the limit does not exist. Here's a common mistake that I need you to avoid. You are not allowed to put an equal sign right here. You can't say that a limit equals infinity. If you put that, you will lose a point on the AP exam. Um, you can't say equals and then say does not exist. That doesn't even make grammatical sense. So I would use the word is. So we can say that the limit of this function is infinity or does not exist. Just to be clear, I would put either one of these but not both. My personal preference is does not exist. Okay, let's do the first two parts of FRQ number four from 1986. Function f is a piecewise function where a and b are constants. Let's do part a, which says that a is two and b is three. Is f continuous? for all x. Justify your answer. If a equals 2 and b equals 3, then the second piece becomes 2x squared plus 3x. Notice that the first piece is an absolute value function. We know that is continuous everywhere. It's just a v. Notice that the second piece is a polynomial function. That is also continuous everywhere. So the only area we have to worry about is the location of x equals 1. According to the definition of continuity, the limit as we approach 1 from the left must equal the limit as we approach 1 from the right. 
So let's check that out. Let's start with the limit as x approaches 1 from the left. On the left side of 1, the function is defined by the absolute value of x minus 1 plus 2. We can find this limit by direct substitution. So let's let x equal 1 in this expression. We end up with the absolute value of 1 minus 1 plus 2. Um, that's just going to be 0, so the limit is 2. Let's compare this to the limit as x approaches 1 from the right. On the right-hand side, the function is defined by 2x squared plus 3x. This limit can be found by direct substitution. So let's let x equal 1, and we will get 2 times 1 squared plus 3 times 1. Well, that's just 2 plus 3, which is 5. Notice that the limit as x approaches 1 from the left does not equal the limit as x approaches 1 from the right. So right there, we have a discontinuity. Remember that the original question for part A was, is f continuous for all values of x? And our final answer will, will be no, since the limit as x approaches 1 from the left does not equal the limit as x approaches 1 from the right, f of x is not continuous at x equals 1. Let's move on to part b. Describe all values of a and b for which f is a continuous function. Remember, we know that function f is continuous to the left of 1 because this is an absolute value function. We know that the function is continuous to the right of 1 because this is a polynomial function. We just need to make sure that f is continuous at the transition between the two functions at x equals 1. According to the definition of continuity, we have to make sure that the limit as x approaches 1 from the left is equal to the limit as x approaches 1 from the right and that has to be equal to the value of the function at 1. That's just the definition of continuity at x equals 1. As before, we can evaluate the limit as x approaches 1 from the left by direct substitution. Let's let x equal 1. This will become the absolute value of 1 minus 1 plus 2 which of course uh, this is just 0 plus 2 so that is just 2. We can also find the second limit by direct substitution. Let's go ahead and plug in 1 for these x's. So that's going to give us a times 1 squared plus b times 1. So of course that's just going to be a plus b. Because of the or equal to part right here, we know that the value of the function at x equals 1 will also be defined by ax squared plus bx. So we can also find that value by direct substitution, which of course gives you the exact same thing as we had for the previous limit, which is just a plus b. So this becomes a little bit redundant. So as far as describing the values of a and b, you can really just focus on this part, right? Because this is just the same thing again. So here's the final answer. f of x will be continuous for values of a and b such that a plus b equals 2.